Hey, may the best monster win. I plan to. Pixar films are beloved for many reasons. From vibrant, often downright stunning animation to relatable, lovable characters, there's always a reason to revisit them. And, of course, there's also the more sinister side of the movies, the villains. And today we're taking an especially in-depth look at this studio's baddies. I'm Kifi Nosi with Wicked Binge, and this is Pixar Villains, evil to most evil. Now, for this list, we're doing our best to not just list supervillains, but also antagonists from Pixar's more peaceful outings. In fact, we have a few villains who could be described as morally decent. These are the well-meaning antagonists, characters with good intentions who are only antagonistic in an inadvertent way. Kicking off our list is the newest Pixar antagonist, Bernie Lumen from Elemental. Ember's father is the closest thing this gorgeously animated rom-com has to an antagonist, and even then, he's an absolutely outstanding man. Bernie is a fire person, owner of the Fireplace Shopping Center, which is one of the only places in Element City to appeal to the culture of the fire people. In both a literal and figurative sense, he's a light to his people. Beyond being a generally good guy, he's also a great father, doting on Ember constantly and supporting her even when she decides to not run the fireplace, assuring her that his dream was not for her to inherit the business, and that his dream was simply her. The shop was never the dream. You were the dream. The only thing making Bernie an antagonist is that he's prejudiced against those of other elemental cultures, which would usually be worse, but given how frequently Bernie and his family were mistreated upon their immigration, and how even Bernie's own father didn't give his blessing when he left, it's all the more impressive that he managed to overcome that by the end of the movie, giving that blessing to his daughter and Wade. It may have taken him sacrificing himself to save her life, but still, Bernie's a good guy, and about as peaceful an antagonist as you can get. Taking our silver medal of good, which admittedly isn't too impressive in the context of this list, is Dr. Sherman, the dentist from Finding Nemo. From the perspective of Marlin, this man is a kidnapper, and from the perspective of the Tank Gang, he's an obstacle that constantly finds a way to ruin their escape plans. With context, however, there's not much to fault Dr. Sherman for. From his perspective, he saved Nemo, thinking that he was struggling for life outside of the reef, Hello, little fella. <laughs> He's a good dentist, a responsible pet owner who genuinely cares about and shows concern for his fish. And really, who wouldn't react the way he did if a pelican barged into your room the way Nigel did? And stop! The worst thing we can say about the guy is that he's got no issues giving fish as a present to his clearly incapable niece, but even then, you could argue he's just trying to be a nice uncle in this instance. He has respect for the animals, which suggests that he almost definitely would have let Nemo go if he knew he was sentient. Taking the bronze medal of good and rounding out the good section of the list of evil is Joy from Inside Out. You would think the literal embodiment of positivity would be anything but an antagonist, but let me give you a little counseling lesson on toxic positivity. Have you ever been down in the dumps and someone's best advice is, hey, Stay positive. That's that's Joy. One could argue that Joy is the most well-meaning antagonist on our list. In fact, she's technically the movie's protagonist, trying to keep Riley happy by any means necessary. But this unfortunately manifests in her bottling up Riley's other emotions, specifically sadness, making her feel worthless while passively aggressively pretending she's giving her an important job by pretending that she doesn't exist. That said, Joy does ultimately learn that sadness is just as important as herself when she herself experiences despair at realizing Riley may never be happy again. She relinquishes control to sadness and learns to acknowledge her place in Riley's psyche as well. Joy, yes Joy, you'll be in charge of the console, keeping Riley happy all day long. And Joy caused a lot of trouble for Riley in her entire mindscape, but she did manage to learn her lesson and fix it. Not to mention that she had nothing but the best of intentions for Riley, which keeps her from falling any lower. Next up are the antagonists who are less overtly nice, but also don't fall into the category of full-on villainy. These are the necessary evils. Kicking this tier off is one of the youngest villains in Pixar history, Darla from Finding Nemo. Okay, so she's not really a villain per se, in fact she's not really doing anything malicious. She's just a hyperactive, somewhat bratty child who gets overexcitable about pet fish. To the fish, she's an absolute menace who's known for killing every new fish she receives, though never maliciously, just out of too much excitement. Regardless, we refrain from placing her in the good category for the fact that, despite her lacking ill intentions, she doesn't really have any outright good qualities either. Any way you slice it, she's just a kid with too much energy, and her fascination with marine life is nothing unnatural. She just really needs to learn how to channel it in healthy ways. You'll find a fishy you can keep alive one day, Darla. Who else could follow her up but Pixar's very first villain, Sid Phillips? To the sentient toys of Toy Story, Sid is a total nightmare. Imagine a giant, more realistic being than your 
yourself, whose favorite hobby is torturing you and your kind. I'd actually rather have a snake in my boot at that point. From launching them on rockets to creating horrifying chimera-esque amalgamations out of their parts, Sid's idea of playtime is rather unconventional. Where are your rebel friends now? <laughs> that said, let's take this in the context of Sid being a regular kid playing with toys. Sure, it's not nice to be so rough with your toys, but riddle me this. How in God's name was he supposed to know that they were sentient? What am I gonna blow? I mean, okay, Sid's a brat for sure, and he's also pretty mean to his little sister, but in terms of the toy torturing, we can't really say that comprises his morality. He's a kid who seems to have a difficult upbringing and is coping with his frustration the only way he can. At least he's not hurting people, for the most part. Sid isn't evil, he just really needs therapy. <laughs> Probably even more after realizing he'd been torturing sentient creatures for years without realizing it. Poor kid. From one of the most iconic to least iconic Pixar antagonists, Terry from Soul is next. Which, may I say, it's a darn shame this movie was overshadowed by other events in 2020 because it's honestly a beautiful story about why it's important to enjoy life instead of just letting it pass you by. It's one of the most underrated Pixar movies, easily, and that's why it's a shame that Terry is the only part of it I'm talking about today. It's his job to count the souls in the great before, and he takes it very seriously. When there's a miscount, he's determined to fix it by getting Joe's soul back to where it belongs. Come to Terry. At one point, he's so desperate to fix his mistake that he briefly takes the soul of another man by mistake. Although, granted, he does give it back right away, plus some free advice to stay away from those processed foods. Seriously, stay away from those processed foods. It shows that he's ruthless when it comes to his work. But while he is cold and very egotistical, even openly insisting on a trophy for the grand gesture of doing something nobody asked him to, Terry is still technically just doing his job at the end of the day. It's like the Grim Reaper. Yeah, he's taking souls, killing people, but he's the Grim Reaper, it's his thing. And while he's definitely the movie's main antagonist, Terry's really just kind of there. A threat to Joe's goal to get back to Earth, but nothing truly malicious, just antagonistic in the confines of the movie. The Pride Medal has to go to Terry, though. That's marvelous! Everybody has known a Terry at some point. Now we've got another bully on our hands, and I'll have you know, it's a lot worse to bully people than toys. Enter Tyler from Turning Red. Nobody likes a bully. Well, at least I hope nobody likes a bully. And Tyler's a pretty good reminder of why. He's constantly mean to May and her friends, frequently insulting her and her family, and later on even blackmailing her to get her to perform at his birthday party as the Red Panda. I'm paying for the Red Panda, not this garbage. All around, he's a pretty big jerk, but he's not all bad. For one, he does offer May money for the aforementioned performance, even though he had all he needed to blackmail her anyway. And in the movie's final act, he runs into May and company at the Four Town concert, revealing himself as a big fan and becoming their friend. Even helping stop Ming's rampage, he ultimately redeemed himself, which is more than we can say for most of the other bullies later on down the line to come. When it comes to villains, they tend to do things manually, but our next guy prefers to stay on Otto because he is Otto. Now, Otto does deserve the distinction for causing the most severe damage to a protagonist between tasing his power source and forcing the plant identifier to crush Wally into nearly irreparable scrap. He's also thrown both Wally and Eve down the garbage chute with the intention to throw them both out to their doom, and it's gotten pretty physical with the captain. You're not getting away from me when I at the same time though, Otto's only following Directive A-113 given to him by BNL's president. In his own words, he's just following his directive. Sure, he, he pulls plenty of tricks, but it's all in the service of his unbiased, unemotional programming, so we can't hold too much against him given that he's a machine. I insist you give me the plan. It would be like saying that Sid's magnifying glass is the main villain of Toy Story 1 because it burned the toys. Now coming back to turning red, the final character before the real bad guys is its main antagonist, Ming Lee. Mei Lin Lee's mother acts as her role model, her best friend, and ironically her worst enemy at the same time. There's no doubt that Ming loves her daughter. She's always around to protect her, after all. Like, like, she's really protective. To the point where she follows her to school to watch her from a distance, confronts anyone she even suspects as troubling her publicly, despite Mei's clear discomfort. Yeah, anyone who's ever dealt with helicopter parenting will feel right at home here. She pressures Mei to be perfect, controlling her life to the point where Mei's afraid to express the slightest disagreement to her. Good. Near the end of the movie, Ming destroys the stadium Four Town is playing at and endangers the entire audience when her panda's unleashed. But this is also where we find out that she too was deeply traumatized by a need to prove herself perfect to her own mother. Ming, 
It's your mother. I'm not here. Ultimately, she does manage to accept May for who she is, and it's at least clear that she was never maliciously being a bad mother, but still, it's clear that Ming's parenting caused May intense stress, and it forced her to bottle up her feelings for years and years. Helicopters are for news crews, not parents. All right, no more gray area-esque commentary now. These guys are definitely villains, but on a smaller scale than those below them. We'll call them the lesser evils. Moving over to Toy Story 4, we now gab about Gabby Gabby. All right, so trying to take Woody's voice box by force is pretty bad. So is bargaining Forky's safety for the voice box and using all of Woody's memories with Andy that she got from Forky to convince him into giving it up. Gabby's a tad bit unsettling and her creepy ventriloquist dummy henchmen don't help matters. That said, she only wanted to be loved by a kid and knew that her busted voice box would kill her chances at that. Wow, you need to fix that. After Gabby gets what she wants though, she holds her end of the bargain and even offers Woody back his voice box when Harmony rejects her. She does ultimately redeem herself and get what she wants by comforting a lost little girl. That doesn't completely erase her crimes, essentially stealing the organs of another toy for her own gain, but it takes a lot to turn your life around. Credit where it's due, I guess. Following her up and really kicking off this category is the serial toy scalper Al, whose placement next to a female toy is probably the closest he's ever had to feeling the touch of a woman. That's okay though, he's more interested in the feel of rare toys toys and cold hard cash. Gonna make me big bucks. <laughs> He's a collector and the owner and proprietor of Al's Toy Barn. Basically, think of comic book guy from The Simpsons as a kid-friendly movie villain. He's rude, snarky, and greedy, not above conning innocent people out of their hard-earned money. At the beginning of the movie, he steals Woody from Andy's mother after attempting to buy him for $5, despite knowing that he was worth way more than that. Even Slinky knew that. His intention was to sell him with the rest of Woody's Roundup gang for big bucks. For those of you who collect figures like Fun Uncle Pops, think of those guys who buy convention exclusives in bulk and sell them for like 300 times the price. The contents of that case are worth more than you make in a year. That's Al. But while he is a huge jerk, that's pretty much the extent of his evil. While he is an inconsiderate con artist who gives a bad name to collectors everywhere, that's really the worst we can say about Al. Now we've got some real monsters. Not in the moral sense though, not quite. It's just Roar Omega Roar from Monsters University. No college film of the Battle of the Fraternities would be complete without the stereotypical, popular, preppy but downright nasty frat squad, and that describes these guys perfectly. They act as the rival team to Uzma Kappa and consist of some of Monster University's best and brightest scarers. Basically, if Sully and these guys are the jocks, Mike and his gang are the nerds. That said, they aren't that evil. Barring some standard jerk behavior, which is pretty tame by the standards of this list, the worst thing they do is publicly humiliate OK on one occasion in an attempt to get them to drop out. But that's not too bad in the grand scheme of things, especially considering the fact that there are legitimate murderous criminals in other movies on this list. Johnny Worthington, president of Roar Omega Roar. Besides, who are you as a teenager is very little indication of who you'll become eventually. Just look at how nice Sully is in Monsters, Inc. And look at, um, <laughs> Randall in Monsters, Inc. Yeah, we'll get to him. For every good dinosaur, there's a, a less good dinosaur. With that being said, Thunderclap is next. Now, like literally every other aspect of this movie, there's barely anything interesting to say about Thunderclap. How do you make a truly reprehensible villain in a dinosaur movie? The answer is you, you really can't. You can call me Thunderclap. The worst you've got is a carnivore that just wants to eat the main character for survival. And sorry to be real for a moment, but that's just nature. Thunderclap is certainly a brutal carnivore, and that scene of him eating an adorable raccoon will haunt our dreams for a while. But hey, a, a dino's gotta eat. The real villain here is the food chain. But Thunderclap is a huge jerk about it, so we're not gonna give him a total pass. The gluttony metal can go to Thunderclap. Dude's gotta eat, but come on, man, the poor raccoon. Nearing the finish line of this category is Cars 3's main villain, Jackson Storm. Jackson is the parallel of lightning as he was in the first movie. Nice redemption arc, by the way. But where McQueen showed genuine admiration for racers like Hudson and the King, Storm looks down upon the older generation and will act any way he needs to emotionally manipulate his competition into giving up or making bad moves, going from patronizing to passive aggressive faster than his own remarkable top speed. You have no idea what a pleasure it is for me to finally beat you. We ranked him a tad bit lower than ROR simply because he was willing to get physical when his normal tactics failed, but it wasn't long before Lightning's pupil, Cruz, showed him up. Jackson Storm, more like Jackass Storm. But he's not even Cars' worst racer, morally speaking. That honor goes to Chick Hicks. Compared to Storm, Chick's method of dealing with opposition on the racetrack is almost hilariously blunt. Where Jackson was a master of manipulation, but played fair otherwise, Chick is just a dirty cheater. He caused a massive pileup to try and delay lightning and intentionally sideswiped the king, leading to one of the most horrific crashes from any of these Cars movies. He's just a spiteful, bitter racer who deserved every boo he got. And 
these next villains are gonna deserve even more. We're now entering the really bad guys, the bad to evil. Here we have a name that's not to be confused with the legendary inventor of steamed hams. Mmm. It's Chef Skinner, sous chef and right hand man to the beloved Chef Gusto until his depression induced death. Skinner is a far cry from Gusto in terms of both ideals and goals. Gusto was a warm presence in his own kitchen, had a firm belief that anyone could cook, and pursued his career out of a love for the art of cooking itself. Skinner, meanwhile, is an angry, overbearing dictator of a head chef spreading doubt and negativity wherever he goes. You are cooking! It's really no wonder why Gusto's was on the decline while this guy was in charge, and that's not even factoring in his besmirching of Gusto's good name by using his recognition to create a line of frozen food products to profit off a dead man's notoriety. Once he loses Gusto's to Linguini, Gusto's biological son, he proceeds to do everything in his power to get the place shut down, and even captures Remy and makes a simple deal, create a new frozen food empire for him, or die. And unlike with Sid or Dr. Sherman, Skinner knows Remy is sentient, or at least has human-like intelligence considering he knows that Remy was Linguini's secret to being a master chef. What a sicko. We're done toying around now. Seriously, we can't play with a collector's item like Stinky Pete, one of Toy Story 2's main antagonists. Stinky Pete is a collector's item from Woody's Roundup, still in the box and in great condition. Pete encourages Jesse, Bullseye, and even Woody to embrace destiny as they're soon to be sold to a collector for big money by Al. But when Woody attempts to escape and get back to Andy, Pete gets in his way, assuring him he won't let anyone get in the way of his destiny of being beloved by children for eternity and revealing his true intentions. It's too late, Woody. That silly Buzz Lightweight can't help you. <laughs> Pete had even turned on the TV while Al was sleeping, so Woody wouldn't be able to get his arm back from him and escape, even letting Jesse take the blame. And while that is pretty bad, we have to note that Stinky Pete is basically a victim of solitary confinement, having been held in storage for years alongside Jesse and Bullseye, and while Jesse was by far the more visibly shaken by it, it would be unreasonable to not assume that it took a toll on Pete's mental state as well. This doesn't justify him threatening to tear Woody to shreds by any means, but it puts him in a more sympathetic light. Anyone who's done research on solitary confinement, much less been through it, knows that it's not something you ever want to go back to. In simple terms, Pete just wants to be loved, which is surprisingly human for a toy. Hopefully he's doing well with Amy. The Darwin Medal is for the prospector Stinky Pete. Has anyone seen his pickaxe? It might be surprising to see a villain as young as Ercolo Viscotti this low on our list, but here we are. He's a teenage bully, but far from a typical one. While Luca is a lower stakes movie than many of Pixar's other films, that doesn't stop Ercole from standing out as a surprisingly vile antagonist. He assures those around him that he loves being mean and harming others. Even his friends aren't safe from this, constantly being treated like slaves to his every whim. Are you hurt? Well, my head Not kinda you. hurt. Knock you, out of the way. He only cares about himself and his reputation, being willing to even murder Luca and Alberto to turn them in for prize money and status. Despite them being sea monsters, they're still just kids, and even if they weren't, attempted murder is no joke. Honestly, getting abandoned by his minions and tossed into a fountain was the least this guy deserved. And unlike Tyler before him, he doesn't show any redeeming qualities whatsoever. This, this guy's just a total jerk. Oh, cool, is that now it's time we go from main antagonists to some minions. No, no, not the yellow guys, nor the piranha dude from Megamind. We're talking about Lotso's minions. Big Baby, Ken, and the others who really aren't that important. Oh, and that terrifying monkey. These guys all work for the big bad of the movie, Lotso, who we'll certainly be getting to later. But for now, just rest assured that they have no issue carrying out Lotso's orders. Be it torturing other toys for information, enforcing Lotso's imprisonment policies, etc., etc. They rarely hesitate to obey their leader. For their crimes, they have to be mentioned, but it's equally worth mentioning that they do seem to have some remnant of heart, unlike Lotso himself. Ken ultimately stands up to Lotso due to his loyalty towards Barbie, and Big Baby aids in his ultimate downfall, turning on him after learning that he was lying about Big Baby being replaced as well. Professionals have standards. I can't possibly excuse their crimes, but if nothing else, they showed some capacity for redemption and decency. Up next, roughly in the same vein, is secondary antagonist Mirage from The Incredibles. It's a wonder how a guy as cruel and geeky as Syndrome managed to land a woman like Mirage, but it may have something to do with the fact that Mirage is pretty darn evil herself. She's Syndrome's most trusted assistant and presumed lover, helping him with his plan to murder all supers and ultimately create a monopoly on powers in general. She's fully willing to help Syndrome with his genocidal intentions and has absolutely no problem with his deceptive, calculating plots. 
Your choice. That is, until Syndrome ultimately fires a missile on a plane, holding Mr. Incredible's family, knowing full well that there are children on board. More on that later, but this is when Mirage started to notice Syndrome was going a bit too far, and when he showed quite literally no concern when Mr. Incredible threatened to kill her unless he was released. Any loyalty towards him remaining at that point was completely depleted. She ultimately redeems herself by freeing Mr. Incredible and helping him defeat Syndrome and his robot. We still have to place her relatively low due to her lack of remorse for aiding in the murder of who knows how many superheroes, but since Mirage actually managed to to do some good by the end of the day, we'll keep her here. Following her and finishing off this category is Charles Muntz. Muntz's descent into villainy is pretty disheartening. He was a beloved and respected worldwide explorer who lost all his acclaim and credibility when scientists believed the skeleton of a gigantic bird he had brought back was fake. Muntz swore that he would come back with a live specimen or never come back at all. Venture is out there! Cut to 70 years later and the man is still on the hunt. He's gone to the point where he had killed two innocent explorers soon after meeting them out of paranoia annoyed that they were after the bird too, and even kept their pilot helmets as trophies. Besides his dogs, Muntz doesn't seem to care about anyone else at this point, and will go to any extremes to kill Carl and Russell and capture the bird. This includes sending his army of vicious attack dogs to rip them to shreds, going after Carl with a sword, hunting down the group with a gun, and leaving a tied up Russell to plummet to his death. It's insanely dark even by Pixar standards. We'll give him this much though. Muntz has spent 70 years in isolation, tracking a bird that is the ticket to getting his fame and status back. <laughs> and is now 90 years old at minimum. Those circumstances would drive anyone insane out of obsession, and it makes the steps, precautions, and countermeasures he takes to snatch and keep the bird very logical. They just happen to be morally reprehensible. Sure, going after a child with a shotgun after attempting to let him fall to his death is not justifiable in the slightest, but there's at least the insanity defense, if nothing else. And while it comes nowhere near justifying his evil deeds, it's just barely enough to keep him out of our final section. These villains are the irredeemably evil. We've got quite the list of evil endeavors to discuss in this category, and we start with Evelyn Dever. We don't even know how to open up this can of worms, so we're just gonna list off all of the horrible deeds she commits to prove the legitimacy of her placement here. Her goal is to have superheroes outlawed forever, and to do so, she became a master hacker and learned how to mind control others. You're gonna help me make supers illegal forever. Under her alias, The Screen Slaver, she uses both monitors and her trademark mind control goggles to relay her message and force unwilling supers to do her bidding. She hypnotizes and frames a pizza delivery guy to throw off Elastigirl. She takes control of Helen, Bob, Lucius, and all the supers her brother Winston had invited in a matter of days. She planned to abandon all the in-limbo supers and foreign diplomats on a runaway boat that would have crashed into the city and killed everyone on board, not to mention very likely a bunch of people on land, and she had no issues letting Elastigirl die from a lack of oxygen when she attempted to apprehend her. And she does all of this with a straight face and complete apathy in her voice. I don't want to die. Ah, nobody does. Jesus, dude. Now, if nothing else, Dever seems to have a solid motive for her crimes. Her dad was gunned down in their own home during a robbery because he wanted to phone for his super friends to save the day instead of hiding in his house's safe room. Father insisted they call his superhero friends. He'd die. And unfortunately, the supers he called had gone underground at the time. She genuinely believes that supers make the citizens weaker, more complacent, and she wants them to be illegal forever so the people can become more self-reliant. Fairly Lex Luthor-like. Now, this is genuinely a good point, and I can definitely sympathize with her, but okay, there's no nice way to say this. Her dad was kind of stupid for that. If you're being robbed at gunpoint, have a safe room to hide in, and you feel the need to call a superhero instead of using it? You're just being ridiculous at that point. Explain yourself. You're also being ridiculous if you believe the best way to reform a society is by committing a minor genocide. We get the ends, but they don't justify the means by any means. Let's speed things up with one last villain from the Cars movies, Miles Axelrod from Cars 2. You know, the one everyone seems to agree is the worst Pixar movie. But if nothing else, it's got a pretty interesting villain. Axelrod seems to be a charming, eccentric, and stupidly rich electric car who organizes a world grand prix with the plan to make an alternative fuel look bad. So cars will flock back to gasoline where he and his fellow outdated lemon cars have the greatest supply of untapped oil reserves, allowing them to reap massive profits out of it. After today, everyone will race back the gasoline. As the head honcho of his criminal organization, Miles is essentially a terrorist. He's organized the murder of a handful of secret agents and tried to have Lightning McQueen killed when he was the last one to stick with all in all in order to sink the reputation of alternative fuel lower. Oh, and as a last resort, he planted a voice activated bomb on Mater with the intention of blowing him and Lightning to pieces. This is like a Mr. Burns level scheme to get rich. 
Excellent. The green metal goes to Miles Axelrod. After we made the Mr. Burns comparison, there was no going back. The desire for fame and fortune really changes people. Let's hone in on the fame part of that and talk about Coco's Ernesto de la Cruz. The living, well, undead proof that Pixar can still make an excellent antagonist. It seems like Cruz is the kind of guy everyone wants to be. Handsome, successful, a real crowd pleaser, and an all around nice guy. But that's only the side of him he wants you to see. In life, Cruz was the musical partner and guitarist to his childhood friend and songwriter Hector Rivera. They had a real shot at glory, but Hector decided to turn it down because he wanted to return home to see his little girl again. One poisoned tequila shot later and Ernesto has become a musical sensation across Mexico by passing off the songs as his own. My friend, you're... You're being forgotten. Now, to poison literally anyone to get fame and fortune is bad enough, but to do it to your own best friend is an entirely different level of just cruel, heartless betrayal. He also tries to kill Miguel for exposing his crimes, and while we're getting alarmingly used to child abuse and attempted murder at this point, that doesn't save him from falling very low on our list. Calling all rangers of Star Command. Because our next villain is Emperor Zerg. Since the very beginning, Zerg has been Buzz Lightyear's arch nemesis, even having an epic showdown with him and Rex in Toy Story 2. No, Buzz. I am your father. As a side note, he looks like one hell of a sick toy, I'd buy him, but he's not toying around when he returns as the main villain of Lightyear. What do you mean we did that pun already? Well, in any case, it's revealed that Zerg is actually Buzz from the future attempting to rectify his mistake that caused immense trouble for Star Command. The one thing we can say in his defense is that he did genuinely want to get back to Earth, and it's clear that both his guilt and his devotion to the plan drove him mad. But that doesn't excuse him for having zero regard for Buzz and the Hawthorne family's safety when present Buzz informs him that his plan will result in all their deaths. Nor does it excuse him killing future Socks. Don't you think he's been through enough having to carry this entire movie on his back? Overall, whatever iteration of Zerg you're looking at, he's a pretty evil guy. But he's at least trying to do something good in his own twisted way. And he at least did less harm to Buzz than the box office did. Sorry, I couldn't resist. What happened with this movie, guys? Next, we have a certain bear to discuss. Wait, it's not Winnie the Pooh? It's Blood and Honey isn't canon? It's okay because it sucked anyway? Or I should probably get off the phone with my assistant. Uh, that's fine. Let's just talk about Mordu from Brave instead. He was once one of the four princes who had inherited an equal claim to his father's throne. Out of a desire to claim it all for himself, he ingested a potion that would give him the strength of ten men, and the result that nobody saw coming. He transformed into an instinct-driven, monstrous 15-foot-tall black bear who slaughtered each of his brothers and the rest is history. His scarred back houses dozens of arrows and blades, representing only a small portion of the warriors he's ended during his massive killing spree across Scotland. Between that and all the bones found at the old castle ruins, Mordu very likely has the largest body count of any Pixar villain. Most importantly, the prince himself is not in control of his actions, and so unlike every other antagonist, he shows no fear whatsoever and attacks any challenger head-on with raging hostility and blind hatred. When the bear is finally put down, the prince's spirit does emerge and gives a thankful nod to both Merida and Eleanor for finally killing his furry prison and releasing him. But sorry, dude, you killed and devoured hundreds, possibly thousands of people during the few centuries you were roaming the country all because you wanted more political power. No amount of nodding is gonna fix all that. Now, all of this would arguably give Mordu a top spot for sure, but honestly, the sheer fact that the prince wasn't in control, instead being driven by the unexpected effect of his potion, it just wouldn't feel right to place him as the most evil villain. Like, yeah, the nodding fixes nothing, but it's at least some kind of remorse. Mordu himself is pure unadulterated evil, but the prince still had some humanity, so we'll keep them just outside of our top five. Man, oh man, do I wish I could put this next guy higher. Next up is my personal favorite Pixar villain, the only other bear in the bunch. What's so hugging bear? He's a big cuddly teddy bear who's said to smell like strawberries. He's got a warm sense of Southern hospitality and is all around a nice guy. First thing you gotta know about me, I'm a hugger. Which makes it all the more terrifying that he's one of Pixar's most ruthless, cruel villains. Lotso is deceptive, manipulative, and cold-hearted. If you're on his side, he'll lie and brainwash you to do his bidding like he did with Big Baby, and if you aren't, he essentially turns Sunnyside Daycare into a concentration camp. He'll place rebels in solitary confinement to use their instruction manuals to turn them into mindless robots, essentially lobotomizing them. They broke me. 
and even when he's got nothing to lose at the end of the movie, he's more than willing to betray the very people who saved his life. There's not a single redeeming quality about this guy, which begs the question of how in the ever-loving hell he's only at number 5 on our list. Well, that's simple. Lotso is the last villain on our list who comes anywhere near sympathetic. The heartbreak of finding out that his owner replaced him after losing him at a picnic was too much for Lotso to bear, which Chuckles states is the exact moment he became Heisenberg. I mean, a ruthless dictator. He's probably more evil than Heisenberg, actually. But since his backstory does bring a tear to my eye every time, I'm willing to give him the absolute minimum of leeway. Just outside of our top three is the CEO of Monsters, Inc., the movie, and the company, Mr. Waternoose. He's an aging CEO of a huge but struggling company that's been passed down by his family from generation to generation and only wants to keep it alive. I would do anything to keep it from going under. This desperation caused him to strip away his morals and team up with Randall to kidnap children for the sake of stealing their screams, using the latter's grudge against Sully to get him to build a machine capable of torturing them with absolute terror to build more energy. In his own words, I'll kidnap a thousand children before I let this company die. What's more, he had no qualms banishing Mike and Sully once they knew too much, even leaving them to presumably freeze to death in a snowy wasteland. All of this goes to show that Waternoose is more than willing to put the safety of anyone, monster or human, as a secondary priority beneath his company. Even Sully, who he seems to both respect as a scarer and care for like a son, is expendable if it means keeping the company running. The one thing keeping Waternoose from falling any lower is that, despite his main concern being keeping the company running, he is ultimately helping combat the energy crisis that Monster Society faces, and unlike Randall, he seems to have at least some disdain for what he's doing. Still, it doesn't change the fact that he's doing it anyway. Now we're entering the top three, and man were these guys difficult to place in order. You know it's gonna get wild when the least evil of this bunch is Hopper. A Bug's Life is one of Pixar's first films, with some brilliant aspects under its belt, the best of them being his villain, Hopper, the leader of the Grasshopper gang that bullies around and constantly puts demands on the ant colony. Much like later villains such as Skinner and Randall, Hopper makes no real attempt to hide his true nature. He uses a mixture of intimidation, fear tactics, and false compassion to keep the ants in line, and his sheer size, strength, and brutality allows him to dominate any one-on-one -on -one encounter with any individual bug. Of course, if he didn't already summon the feral thumper to curb stomp them. No! Bad grasshopper! Bad grasshopper! Pushing the boundaries of what can fly in a kid's movie villain, Hopper is a ruthless dictator and way smarter than he looks. He knows the ants could easily overwhelm them with numbers and gives an accurate portrayal of this by crushing three of his own under an avalanche of grain. He terrifies his own gang, and the only reason he hasn't killed his brother is because he made a promise to his dying mother. He came close to having Princess Dot, a fairly young child, hurt by Thumper to make an example, and when the ants weren't able to provide twice their usual offer, he planned to kill their queen and take all the food by force, leaving the rest of the colony to starve to death. What sinks Hopper so much lower than most of his competition is that this movie doesn't even make an attempt to give him an excuse for being evil. He's just a selfish violent, malicious vermin from start to finish. Do I look stupid to you? But, um, the whole dying mother thing at least gives him an almost sympathetic side. He took the gold medal of evil on our old version of this video, but today we're giving Syndrome the runner-up position. Look, we've all had dreams from our childhood that didn't come true. For Buddy, it was a desire to become Mr. Incredible's sidekick. Well, I'm Incrediboy! What? No. Unfortunately, in his busy schedule and slight egotism, Mr. Incredible was often short with Buddy, neglecting him until eventually handing him over to the police after he inadvertently had a hand in a criminal bombing. This eventually turned Buddy into Syndrome, a man with an extreme resentment for all supers, working with Mirage to murder every one of them, one by one, on the down low, with the intent to start a monopoly on superpowers so nobody would be truly super anymore. This is bad enough, but nobody is safe from Syndrome. That includes kids, since he had no issue firing a missile at a jet containing Mr. Incredible's family, knowingly, and Mirage, who he shows no concern for when her life is presumably at stake. Considering she's his right-hand woman and his implied lover, it'd be hard to imagine anyone Syndrome cares more about, so the fact that he didn't even sweat a single drop at the thought of losing her speaks a lot to his completely vile character. Now go ahead. We're giving the Wrath Medal to Syndrome, who held enough of a grudge against Mr. Incredible to feel that it justified killing countless supers and even innocents. It's hard to outdo a guy like that in terms of pure evil, and Syndrome has absolutely no redeeming qualities, only wanting fame, glory, and the death of anyone who dares to think otherwise. You'd think there's no possible way anyone can outdo him, right? But while that would be reasonable, I'm giving the Gold Medal of Evil to Monsters, Inc.'s other main villain, Randall Boggs. I'm sure Randall would be glad to know that he scared the absolute heck out of me as a kid, especially given that being terrible 
terrifying is his whole motive. Even in a society of monsters who rely on scaring children to make energy, Randall sticks out as especially freaky. Unlike Waternoose, who's at least concerned with keeping the company afloat and helping the energy crisis, Randall has no such good intentions. His only desire is to become a better scarer than Sully, and he's more than willing to help Waternoose using the Scream Extractor if it means taking Sully down. Cheating be darned! If all this weren't bad enough, he's also a sadist. He takes genuine joy in using the Scream Extractor, which is basically torture. He at one point tortures Mike to get information, and seeing how many extra tanks of energy he has at night, it can be assumed that he's tortured many, many human children for their screams. Say hello to the Scream Extractor. Scaring them, scarring them for life, and showing absolutely no remorse. For context, imagine if instead Randall were a human and tortured puppies and kitties to win a competition. It's hard for me to even read that sentence, and Randall does it not only for glory, he does it for fun. The Envy Medal also goes to Randall because he's proof that competitiveness can go too far. That's the last time I lose to you, Sullivan. You might expect us to mention Randall's time at Monsters University, where he initially seemed like a decently nice guy to his roommate, Mike, but he also willingly abandons Mike to hang out with the popular kids. And when he's humiliated by Roar Omega Roar later on, he gains a burning hatred of Sully and even Mike, vowing to never lose to them again. Randall's only motivation is sheer pettiness and the desire for glory and vengeance. His love for torturing children and causing terror and willingness to use force against anyone who gets in his way is just the icing on the cake. I'm normally not really an advocate for violence, but in this case, you just shovel this man to your heart's content, lady in the RV. <laughs> 